Hello, Dominic Herbst here with Restoring Relationships, and I'm looking forward to sharing something very, very important with you. If, if uh, family restoration is important and always on the list because the devil's constantly coming against any type of family uh, ordained by God, the institution ordained by God, marriage and family. And this title is Personal Repentance to God is the Only Path to Family Restoration. Now, you may not have heard it this way before because what the enemy does is he trips us up with his lies by telling us that if the other people would stop doing what they're doing and stop hurting me and putting me in such a bad situation and coming against me, if they would just stop this family, I would be restored, everything would be fine. No, that's an incomplete assessment. Even if you have really, really uh, challenging offenders around you in your family. And we all have had that. We've all had seasons of family division, maybe two brothers, maybe a sister brother, maybe a parent child, and, and typically in our extended family or our current family of context. When I say extended family, that would be with the family I was a son and a brother in, in the years ago. Now, some of them are still living, my parents are not, and one of my siblings is gone, but that's my extended family when I was a son. My current family of context is where I'm the father and the husband, I have a wife and I have two children. So regardless of which family we're talking about, only true repentance in you and I is the greatest hope for the full restoration of the family. What God does through repentance and the forgiveness of sin in me, even if I am the victim, once again, I'm sure that's new to you because the enemy puts us in a position we, where we are blinded to truth. He will give us, according to Romans 125, and the exchange of the truth of God for the lie. So be careful because if you're listening to this, and you are the primary, as you see it, victim of a family conflict, this is for you. You might think, oh, no, 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 it's for them that are offending me. Oh, it would help them tremendously. But the truth is, if you follow obedience to the Holy Spirit and the truth of the Word of God, the glory of God will shine through you in ways that you have never imagined and draw the hearts of those who are now estranged from you or in conflict with you. You might say, well, I don't even see them anymore. Nobody wants to be around each other. All we do is choke on each other. Yeah, I remember some days like that too in, in years past, but it doesn't have to be that way, nor do you even have to have contact directly with them for the message of God to go forth through you in the spirit realm. In other words, whatever transformation is happening in you and I has everything to do with the hope of a transformation in them, even if you have no contact with them. Because you see, you, you don't understand the spiritual realm. I don't understand it, but I know this, that whatever happens in me spiritually and who I'm connected with spiritually on the basis of God bearing witness to them as he bears witness to me, that communication occurs directly from the throne room to them. They could be on the other side of the earth. They could have written you off. They could have completely uh, uh, you know, you know, said to you that you're, you're no longer my son or my brother or my daughter or my sister or my mother or my father and God will bear witness with them. But he wants to deal exclusively with you and me. If you let God have you exclusively in this realm, you will be what I call the prophet or prophetess of healing. What is that? The agent that God uses that he, has, that he can transform individually to be the first one who is set free and rises above all the sewage and the conflict and the disgusting bitterness and hatred that is pouring out for the people we care about most. So you have this chance. It's your choice. God is calling you. He is drawing you to this. That's what this message is about, and that's why you are listening to it now. Many of you have been waiting and struggling far too long to find reconciliation and restoration with someone close to you. If so, you're not alone. The problem may be that you are looking to them to do something different when the Holy Spirit is drawing you to do something different. You say, I've tried everything. They won't listen. That's because you've been trying in the flesh and you have not been trusting God in the Spirit. See, right there, that's point one. 
Stop your trying. You know, there's an old song. It's not in trying. It's in trusting. It's not in running. It's in resting. Everything in the spiritual realm is counterintuitive. Stop doing things in the spiritual realm that you're doing in the flesh. Won't work, won't have the same impact, never intended to, because no flesh will glory in God's presence. So the Spirit is bearing witness to show you what you do not see and to let God have access to certain places within you that have yet to be surrendered to Him. Did you ever wonder when the enemy is pounding these wedges into the family relationships that he is meaning it to destroy, which we're all in agreement on, but what, God, what the enemy is using to destroy all of us and to blow us apart, God is using to reveal within us what we haven't seen or we don't want to look at. And if we can't see it or refuse to see it, then we can't surrender it. How do you deal with an enemy within you if you refuse to see it or the enemy has blinded you to that enemy? So keep that. That's a point number two there. But what about when he or she offended me? You know, what about them? Have you never offended them ever? Isn't it amazing how the enemy will blind you to all your offenses against the others? but will give you a theater in your mind of every detail, every place, every situation where they've offended you. The enemy is able to edit the movie, the theater in your mind, that is playing constantly so that all you see is what they did to you and when they did it and how bad they were when they did it. But the enemy blinds you to what you have done. Not only to what you have done to them, but what you've thought about them, what you've spoken and whispered about them. Isn't that amazing? Somehow that just leaves the recollection of our minds. And we're accountable, 100%. See, we, the enemy actually will uh, uh, tell you that you're better than them, when in fact, you're every bit the dark sinner that they are. Well, they did it more. <laughs> are we going to deal in volume now? He who offendeth the law at one point offendeth the whole law. One sin against God is equal to sinning repeatedly against God because he can't tolerate sin and he's perfect, holy, and sinless. So we're all fallen. So you see, we can't use this little measuring rod to who's worse and, and, and who's less uh, of an offender. It's not about that. God's saying, I have appointed you to be the one who is going to come to me first exclusively. See, but that spirit of pride invades our minds and says it's them. It's not me. They offended me first, so how dare they expect me to come to them and submit first? Where did you get that? That's not biblical at all, that the one who offended first. No, Matthew 18, 15 through 17 says that if thy brother offend thee, meaning any other human being, family member, sister, mother, father, uh, all genders are included in that, who offended you, go to them. You and them, just go. And if they don't hear you, take another in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. So think about this. That's a doctrine of demons. You're, you're automatically accepting the lies of the enemy on the basis of how you deal with interpersonal conflict and whether or not you're going to be willing to restore. That's 1 Timothy 4.1 that now the Spirit, Holy Spirit, speaks expressly that in the latter times, these are the latter, later times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Be careful. You're being seduced every day. Well, you may come under uh, some of it, and you may not come under, but whatever you come under, you've already been blinded and bound. Once you're blind, you're bound. So, thank you, Father, that Jesus never said that. Well, they offended me first, meaning you and I, his creation, and therefore I'm not going to a cross for them. He could have refused the cross, but he did not, and he died for us while we were yet sinners. Think about it. We were in our worst sinning state, and he still went to the cross. And while he was on the cross, the people around the cross were reviling him and blaspheming him while they were torturing him physically. So he was being tortured at every level, mental, mentally, physically, uh, you know, uh, the emotionally and also in the spiritual realm. Then saith he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. This is in Gethsemane. And he went a little farther and he fell on his face and he prayed to God alone. And he said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. We know the answer he got. We didn't hear it. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's what God is saying to you. Stop following your will as to how you think 
you should try to heal this family. You're part of the problem. You see, there are many things that man breaks that only God can fix. Stop trying to fix what you are uh, already broke. That you, They may have initially broken. You may say, I can tell you the starting point. It was them, it wasn't me. Here's the problem. Every response within you and I, since it's been broke, needs to be surrendered before God because it's not pretty. And you know it isn't. And the enemy will tell you, well, you know, you're not really uh, reviling back at them. So you're the better person. You're a Christian. Be careful. He's speaking to you with that lying tongue. And it's coming into your mind and it becomes the basis by which you speak. It really wasn't my fault. You got to be careful. God judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart at the deepest recesses of our spirit. He sees what you and I don't want to see. And the enemy will do everything in his power to put that shroud over that area, that blanket that covers death. And he'll keep that hidden so that the light of the Holy Spirit does not shine on it. And this is why David said, because it is now time to repent, he said in verse 4 of Psalm 51, he said, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak. David was talking to the Lord. Now we know, wait a minute, he sinned against a lot of people on earth. Why is he saying he only sinned against God? Because in the context by which this was shared, David understood that if he did not pull away from all fallen humanity and get before the Lord fully, completely apart from everyone else, that what would happen was he would the enemy would get in there and find excuses that he had on the basis for what he did. But when he found himself alone before God with the full light of the Holy Spirit shining through him, not just on him, through him, he, he was repenting and saying, my sin is against you first. Even though I sinned against my wife, my family, the, the, the wife and husband of another man, another family, I sinned against all of Israel because I am king. That is nothing compared to the fact that I have sinned before you. One of the most powerful passages in Scripture. You see, God will not bless you and I while we hold bitterness within our hearts. Whether we see it or not, that's why it's called a root. If you have bitterness, you don't see it. So you'll say you don't have it. Be careful. It's that convincing. And because if you don't have it, you're not being honest with yourself. And you know why. But let God tell you this. Don't, don't hear it from me. Let God show you. He will not hear us, the Lord, while we hold fast to pride and rebellion in us. That's the shroud that covers the bitterness. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He won't. Therefore, your prayers are not going heard by Christ. So if I regard iniquity, that is self-will, that's pride, that's rebellion, that's evil. It's evil. We hate to say that. We're believers. Well, look at Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's really, really ugly. Ooh, ooh. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's your heart. That's my heart. So this psalm is David's prayer of unconditional repentance for taking Bathsheba. When David sinned against her, Nathan the prophet came and said to him at, at the end of a story that, that David thought was kind of a parable thing, or actually an actual event that was happening in his kingdom uh, about a man who took another man's lamb and that sort of thing. And David said, who is this man? Nathan said, thou art the man. And that's what led him into brokenness. You see, when David saw his need to repent what he had done against God, it cost him grievously, as my sin does, as your sin does. So I'm not doing any judgment on any of you. I best do judgment only on me and let God judge me as I am and show me what I do not see and show me what I don't want to see. The sacrifices of God or a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, they, oh God, you will not despise. Last thing we ever want is brokenness. But in the realm of the spirit, brokenness is the closest place in 
communion of spirit that we will ever know with God. And it's in that brokenness that we will be able to come and repent before those that we have hurt on earth and take accountability for our actions for hurting them. And if we fail to do that, we will never have a knittedness with their soul. As Jonathan and David is revealed uh, in Samuel, how Jonathan's soul was knit with the soul of David and Jonathan loved David as his own soul. You can't knit. Friends, you can't knit unless there's a cleansing and purifying of that offense or those offenses that you and I have wedged between us and those that we care about most. But if we don't go vertical, in and up, if we don't go there first and we are not cleansed by the only one who can cleanse us with the blood of Jesus, then we, we will never have any more than an artificial reconnection with those on the horizontal plane. And that's why many of our restorations don't last. Everybody goes through the motions on the horizontal plane, meaning person to person. And we actually think, well, you know, it, it originated here. It, it sustained here. It's still here. So we keep it here. You know, we, we think like those people in Vegas, right? What's done here stays and what's done in Vegas stays in Vegas. No, no. Everything is known into the supernatural realm of the throne room. So we fail to recognize that our sin against another on earth is first and foremost sinning against God. So the conflict, again, may originate here between two or more fallen people. However, whatever violations happen on earth are immediately revealed into the spiritual realm of heaven as a direct sin against God on the vertical plane. That's why, first and foremost, once we see our sin and recognize what we have done, we pull away. Now you might say, well, if I'm really getting hammered and I'm not doing anything, and I feel like I'm being uh, unjustifiably hammered. And are you telling me I gotta go to God and repent? Well, it can never be wrong. And why would it be wrong? And why would you not be willing to do that? I mean, he is God. And if the enemy has blinding power, which is why Jesus said, I've come to give sight to the blind, why wouldn't we constantly do the inventory in, in, in the presence of God through the bright shining light of his Holy Spirit pouring through us? Why would we take the risk that there's not some unseen sin or area that has not been fully surrendered to God that the enemy will use to torment me and keep me in division and keep me with a contemptible heart towards those who have offended me. So the question actually comes back on you. You might say, why should I do that? They're the biggest offenders. Because when your soul is offended, it is postured because of how fearfully and wonderfully you're made to respond back. And when you're fallen and in the flesh, which we all are, that response is not going to be pretty because you're not, the first way you're looking is not to God. Okay, some people say, you know, the, the Holy Spirit convicted me and I realized the enemy was going to use this to pull me under. And I said, Lord, I forgive them. And if you can forgive before the poison has penetrated your soul, creating a seed of contempt that begins to grow with a root of bitterness that goes all through your soul, making you toxic, and then springs forth where many be defiled in Hebrews 12, 15. He's talking to believers. If that forgiveness goes forth for them, which is why Christ required it, uh, that's good. And you'll know because you'll be set free. But if you do not feel the freedom or experience the freedom that only the Holy Spirit can bring you, that forgiveness did not go forth. You may say, why well, do it over and over? You need to look at this. The reason why the forgiveness is not going forth is there's already bitterness in your heart. And again, God won't hear you. If I regard iniquity, bitterness, hate in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, 18. So you immediately shift it around and say, you know what? It's not about them. Well, how do I say that? They're the ones offending me. No, it's not about them right now. It's you and God. You and God. Well, what about them? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I'll repay. But see, we say that. We say, well, yeah, that's true. But we don't believe it. We don't trust it. Because we immediately go into vengeance with bitterness. So if God judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart, we're already judging them with the bitterness. We're no different. And if we hate them, we've just trumped everything they did to us. 1 John 3, 15, if you hate that person who offended you, you're a murderer. We already covered that part. I'm not going to go back to that. And it's a murder by proxy, meaning that 
If God's judging the intents of your heart, you're being judged for murder. He said it. That's not a based on opinion. This is all truth. But you've been waiting for a long time for family rec reconciliation and restoration and letting the devil convince you it's them. They don't want to restore. You have no idea the leverage you have when you are totally surrendered into the fullness of the Spirit, into the place where he's pouring through you and the glory of God comes through you in so many ways. They will be drawn to you to want the restoration. They're going to want what you got. And here you are sitting back and saying, I've done all I can do. All I can do is pray. Well, yeah, praying is good, but how about asking God to show you that which you do not see? And that's what this is about because it will always lead to repentance. And it should lead to a godly sorrow that brings forth repentance unto salvation. So, once again here, okay, the conflict may originate in the horizontal plane between two or more fallen people. However, whatever violations happen on earth are immediately revealed in the spiritual realm. When we sin against another, we are sinning against God in heaven. Therefore, our sinful actions against others require that we privately make amends with God first before restoring with those that we offended on earth. Look at 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, him the Lord, a liar, and his word is not in us. So actually we're lying when we say we have no sin. We're lying. It's them. They sinned against me. You're lying. You're lying. Because the truth of what is in you, only God will be able to show you because you've self-blinded yourself in pride, sin, and thinking that you're not accountable. But I don't get it. I was a victim. Yes, you were. And being a victim doesn't make you a sinner. But your soul was responding at that point. You don't know it because the enemy is right in there with the response. And, and if it wasn't going fully upward to God in the moment you were violated, you were delaying right then and there of any type of forgiveness and the, the seed of contempt was already planted. And until that's cleansed, it's going to grow into a root of bitterness. I remember the day I said, Lord, I know I'm right here. It's them, not me. I see it. That's the first and last time I said that. Because he said this, he said, how you're right is wrong. I don't know if you can fit that. Have you ever been so right that you were wrong? Meaning your attitude, your pride, your selfishness, your contempt. Oh, well, I'm the victim. Yep. Yep. You get all this false feeling of justification to now punish them in your mind and in your heart. Even if you never say anything to them. I was right at the top of my voice. You know what that means. The attitude in me was condemning them. The thoughts in me was condemning them. They were condemning them. I became their judge after they offended me. We don't see how very fine-tuned this methodology the enemy uses in his tactical nature to bind you and blind you and me in this place of bitterness. That's why it's called a root. If we don't repent, that root does not leave. I've heard many people say, I, I just got to let it go. Yeah, that's like the Disney song. You want to go new age? Go ahead, give that a shot. That's like telling a man, uh, a man with cancer, sir, you do have the cancer. We'll show you where it's at, but just let it go. Just let it go. It's time to get a new doctor. And he's our great physician for the cleansing and purifying of the soul. You don't let it go. You don't have it. It has you. It owns you. As cancer has the man, as gripping, as penetrating throughout his body, it needs to be cleansed. The tissue and the skin and the, and the inner workings of the blood need to be cleansed and purified for that man to be free of the cancer. Bitterness is the cancer of the soul. You don't let it go. Oh, I, I know. I, I won't think about it. You're going to tell a man with cancer, sir, just, just don't think about it. How about this? In time, you'll be okay. Time heals all wounds. No. Time heals cleansed wounds. Time does not heal infected wounds. When you have an infectious disease or you have a cancer, you need to be cleansed. In time, that man will be dead. 
because nothing was done to do the cleansing of the cancer out of his body. Same with bitterness. What is it I do? I look to the great physician and I recognize that this is bigger than me and I recognize there's not anybody in fallen humanity. There's not a therapist, a counselor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or a medicine that's going to be able to cleanse me from bitterness and hate. But that will be the biggest reason I'm taking medicine. You, you, you never looked at it that way. Depression comes from a bitter heart. Depression comes from imploding hatred. The exploder is the one who loses his temperament, but the one who implodes. Just like they use the same dynamite to blow out a building as a terrorist would, uh, so it is when they want to haul a building off this particular place, they implode it. Same dynamite. Either way, it's highly destructive. It's not to be in the soul. Again, the only way to get rid of the, the dynamite, the TNT, the nitroglycerin, is to be cleansed of it. The only one who can cleanse you is the Christ. The only way he'll cleanse you is through repentance and requesting forgiveness for the sin of bitterness that re was the response for the violation. So you see, I became, somebody sinned against me and I became a sinner in response, but I didn't see it. And oftentimes we are offended by people. They don't even know that they're offending us, but we get embittered and we feel that contempt for them. No matter what the situation or scenario, we are to go in and up on the vertical, even if it originated on the horizontal between two people, okay, and it was sustained on the horizontal in the conflict where the family split apart. We are to pull away, go in and up to the throne room, you and me, Lord, me and you, alone, apart from all, asking God to forgive me, repenting and turning away, saying, I don't want to come under the violations that have been done against me. Vengeance is yours, you said. You'll repay. I leave that to you. But now what I need is to be set free of my vengeance, personal vengeance, which I have no right to. So as we move forward here, that means what started out between you and another family member that led to a bitter root in your heart is regarded as sin and rebellion against God, regardless of how deeply you were offended or repeatedly offended. All right, so we've got that established now in 1 John 3, 15. Remember, if I have hate or bitterness for anyone, I'm a murderer. <laughs> that's a metaphor. That's not a simile, kind of like a murderer. No, that's a metaphor. And what we say, well... It's a little bit harsh. I wouldn't really take life out of their body. No, but you'll, you'll take life out of their soul with the darkness of your hatred. You'll put the shroud over them as far as you're concerned. You don't want them to be around you or exist. If you withhold forgiveness for one minute after being offended, for one minute, you are already, the seed of contempt is already in you. You never looked at it that way. Well, I didn't feel any different. You won't because the enemy can desensitize you to the impact of your violation. That's what he does. It's another one of his tactics. That's the gall of bitterness spoken about in Acts chapter 8. I don't have time to go into that right now. The gall, it, it, it was the anesthesia of that era, gall of bitterness, meaning bitterness will desensitize you. It's like having Novocaine when they're scraping, poking, and drilling your teeth on the dentist chair. Oh, I didn't have any feeling. Yeah, you did, but you didn't feel it. <laughs> in other words, your nerve endings were responding when all that trauma was going on, but the, the anesthesia kept you from feeling it, so no, I didn't have any pain. Yes, you did. You didn't feel the pain. But when that wore off, that trauma was revealed. So be careful. And then consider this. With our tongue, we bless God and the Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God, which means in his image. And he says, out of the same mouth, proceed blessing and cursing. James is questioning us. All the brethren, what are you doing? Do you bless God? Well, they offended me. God is God. I trust God. I love God. But I don't like what they did. I have bitterness towards them. You won't make me say the words, but your soul is responding with the expression of bitterness and even hatred. I call it the number one lie in the church. I don't hate that person. It is not typically, I said that, and I was I hated them. It's not typically a lie of, of uh, uh, intention. Like you know you have the hate and you're saying I don't hate them. Hate will blind you, 1 John 2, 9 to 11. 
If a man hates his brother, he walks in darkness. The enemy puts the dark veil over him, the dark shroud. He's under darkness, can't see it. And he walks in darkness and he stumbles. That's where his life is starting to really kind of come apart. That's the stumbling of the repeated fruit of bitterness, whereby springing up many be defiled. Okay, so in effect, he is tripping over himself because he's under darkness. And you say, well, you mean his eyes are blind like these eyes? No, his mind's eye. It says, and, and if a man hates his brother, he walks in darkness and he keeps stumbling and he doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. In the Greek, it's his mind's eye. So how can he address any problem that is in him that he can't see? He's blind. He can't see it. So that's why don't trust your thoughts. Did not, in the stronghold verses, written to the believers at Corinth, the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Only can be brought down and pulled down by the power of God, like Jericho. Jericho is not brought down by the Israelites. As a matter of fact, the captain of the Lord of Hosts, it was the, the uh, Christophany, the pre-incarnate Christ, said to Joshua, do not attack, you will not prevail. I'll bring the walls down but I will use you to engage. They will see my glory through you by marching around. That's a stronghold. The Old Testament represented as a stronghold in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. What is that? In the mind and every high thing in the mind that um, and every high thing not submitted to the Lord God. So either the enemy is going to take your thoughts captive or you're going to take your thoughts captive in the name of Jesus Christ and cast them down. Every high thing that exalts itself against God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The war is in your thought life. So if you're trusting your thoughts and analyzing this whole conflict, you've already lost. You've been completely blinded. And the enemy, you, you might as well you might as well put strings on you because the puppet master is having more freedom and more influence over you than the Holy Spirit is in you. But you've let him. You belong to Christ. It's not a matter of who you belong to, but you're just working more for the enemy, the devil. That's why Jesus said in 844 of John, he said to the Pharisees, they were the most religious people of that day, you were of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and a liar and the father of lies. The truth is not in him. He's telling the religious leaders. No wonder they wanted to kill him, right? He said, You're, I'm not your father. God the Father is not your father because you don't do the things of God the Father. You do the things of your father, the devil. So when we're in this family conflict, we don't realize it. We're operating as if the devil's our father. Wait, I told you I'm not the offender. Oh, no, you're the, you're the secret offender in responding back. And I got to keep saying this because the devil's going to steal the truth from you. And the devil is hiding in the secrecy of what he lets you see. Remember, he stacks up everything that was done to you and I, and that's all we feed on. It feed, we feed on it. We eat it. We chew the cut of bitterness. And then it feeds back on us. It's parasitic. And people we've offended, oh, it's nothing compared to how I was offended. When you repent and you come to Christ, those two lists, they reverse. People that you and I offended is like this. And the people that offended us, it won't matter. It won't matter. It won't have the power. It won't reorder my life. This is so serious, but it's so amazing because if we can get to it, and I'm not going to get to all this. Even though David sinned against his own house, we already covered that. He was saying, you know, against thee and thee only have I sinned. And I love this verse in verse 7 of Psalm 51. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. You'll feel cleansed and purified. Only God can do it though. You can't let it go. You know, like the song, let it go. That's why those songs are out there. They're new agey. They, they make you believe that something you broke that nobody else can fix but God, that you can somehow fix it by just letting it go. Be careful. The devil will just let you and I miss it by this much. If he lets us miss it by this much, it's as far as heaven is above the earth. We need a cleansing 
of the blood of Jesus. How perfect we are in Holy Week. The blood of Jesus. We are in Holy Week right now. That crucifixion had a price to it beyond any measure that you and I, especially in our finite state, could ever, ever comprehend. And if it took the cost of the crucifixion, the reviling and the blasphemy, and the horrific way that the Son of God was treated to deliver us from sin, you think you can take that bitter heart and just let it go after that price was paid? How dare we trample on the blood of Christ. Take this seriously and then watch how the Lord God transforms your family conflict into full reconciliation and restoration, sometimes one by one. But once the catalytic nature of one person in this extended family or in this nuclear family, the family today, or the family at church, or the family where you work, or the family in your social group. It starts with you, one. God's looking at you. And why is it you? Because you're the one listening to this. The rest of them, they probably would not have heeded this, but you will. In the name of Jesus Christ, you will believe this, and you will receive this. Read Psalm 51 and recognize that all Transformation and only transformation is coming from a willingness to repent to God and ask him to cleanse you with the blood of Christ for forgiveness. Pray with me. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray that your Holy Spirit would imprint upon every heart and mind this truth and that they not only not lose it, but they can't do anything else in their life until they will walk it out in obedience. It's not enough to hear if I do not heed. James said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. I'm asking, Lord, that you would burn within the heart of everyone who is hearing a willingness to not only pull themselves away and get with God, but to be fully transparent and ask God to show them what they do not see, to ask God to show them their sin. And as God, Holy Spirit, come and shine the light in that they would repent and say, I'm turning from my sin. And I'm asking you now, Lord, to cleanse me. And I, I'm asking for forgiveness of my sin against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight and then they will go methodically to those that they want to restore with and they would submit themselves one to another until your Holy Spirit Lord begins to reach each one of their family members oftentimes through the one who came to you first in the name of Jesus Christ we pray amen have a glorious resurrection weekend and be 